You're very welcome to the Oma Heritage Trail and I'm going to tell you about the Shobans. I'll tell you a wee bit about the history of the Shobans. And the Shobans were a phenomenon in the 1950s, 60s and 70s. And on the trail we're going to see some places that were closely involved with the Shobans. So come on with me and I'll take you down the streets of Oma. There's a girl I long to call my own The sweetest road that Ireland's ever grown And true with the moon and stars above I'm falling head over heels in love With a pretty little girl from Oma In the county of Tyrone The many and varied images on the boards of the exhibition cover the influences on the rise of the show bands in Oma from the 19th century where you had St Eugene's Band and then in the middle of the 20th century you had the development of the pantos in Oma which were a, a phenomenal success. You had also the influence of traditional music and ballads on the development and the rise of the show bands. You can see then the story of the show, began, the show bands beginning with the uh, Clipper Carlton from Strabane Newton Stewart. The development then through the Melody Aces and the Platters changed their name to the Platter Men. And the Platter Men became one of the most successful show bands in that whole era's history. From the Platter Men, we can see then the way that music changed, the rise of the, the Buckaroos, which had a, a, quite a, a country sound, whereas the, the Platters and the Platter Men were more of a pop sound. Uh, we also then can see the rise of the, the Polka Dots, and from that, uh, the development of the pop sound with Derek and the Sounds, with the great Derek Mahaffey. And then from that we can leap into then the singers like Frank Chisholm in the 1970s who took music in this part of the world into a completely different direction. The exhibition tells the story. The history hasn't been written yet. There is no de definitive history of the show bands. But these images and the information in this exhibition will give you some sense of the importance of the show bands, the development of the show bands and the demise of the show bands. My ring and tells her friend she's gonna marry me. The best of all, she tells them all she's happy as can be. My name is Tom Sweeney and I'm a singer and songwriter and entertainer. The show band started roughly around the late 1950s. You must remember, first of all, back in those days, there were no TV, very little radio. Uh, the only places where young people could meet young men and young women in their teens and so forth were the dance halls. And when the dance bands began, the dance halls, every parish in Ireland had a dance hall. And they would be packed on maybe Friday night, Saturday or Sunday. And it was, it was a social necessity. There was nowhere else to go. There were no bars. There were no, I mean, young people couldn't go into a bar then. Um, and they couldn't even sell alcohol in the dance halls either. They only sold they called it lemonade or orange juice, you know. So show bands and dance halls were very, not just important musically, they were very important socially for the interaction of young people all across Ireland. Well, like anything, if, if it's new, there are going to be people against it, you know. And these show bands were doing a lot of cover versions of songs from the charts in America and so forth, you know. And I suppose a lot of the old conservatives in Ireland would have seen it as a, a bit new and a bit sort of, uh, not risque, but a bit not in keeping with, with, with the, the, the Irish country ways, you know. But then uh, once, that, once they got over that, they were absolutely massive, they were huge. Well, Stephen McKenna, you may, may or may not know, Stephen McKenna uh, wrote a column here for the newspaper for 50 years every week. Uh, the Ulster Herald called As The Man Says, but he was also a brilliant musical brain too. And Stevie used to write a lot of the pantomimes and shows here, and he would write the, the, the scripts and I would help to write the songs and so forth. But to work with Stevie was an absolute pleasure. He was a dear friend of mine and I miss him every day. Brilliant man. It was great to work with him, yeah. Well, my name is Phelan O'Neill. I'm a nephew of Jimmy O'Neill, my father's brother, who formed and ran the uh, Swing Earls in the 50s, late 50s. Jim, uh, my uncle, like, like most 
early show band members um, started off life in the, with the um, St Eugene's Brass and Reed Band, which was the full title was St Eugene's Temperance Brass and Reed Band, which was uh, which was formed in Oma um, uh, way back way back in the mists of time, really. Um, and a lot of uh, the musicians who joined Jim and the Swing Earls were also in St Eugene's Band. So they had their early tuition, if you like, in their instruments, especially brass instruments, uh, in that band. Um, and uh, dance bands were beginning to be popular around that time, so um, I suppose some of them got together and wanted to extend their musical experience in a show band. Well, they weren't called show bands then, they were called orchestras. So the Swing Earls, for example, was called the Swing Earls Orchestra when it formed. Uh, and that was not unusual because there's a famous band conductor then called Joe Loss, orchestra conductor called Joe Loss, uh, who used to tour uh, with his orchestra and he toured Northern Ireland as well. So orchestra was the name of the game then. And gradually the orchestras morphed into show bands. Yeah. Uh, what would your earliest memories be of the show bands? Um, probably earliest memory would be uh, Jim, uh, Uncle Jim practicing his instruments. Jim was a gifted musician, he was a very natural musician. I think he had six lessons in music and then he was free, you know, taught himself. But he played the clarinet, he played the sax, saxophone, that's the tenor sax and the alto sax. He played the uh, flute as well. Um, and he was, uh, he also wrote music and and did a lot of the arrangements for the band when he formed the band. So a lot of my early members was, was listening to him practice his skills uh, at home. The town hall in Oma is a last no more. It was built in the early part of the 20th century and for many, many years it served as a venue for entertainers, musicians and many, many events. Performers such as the great Michal McLeamer throughout its boards. Local legend has it that the great tenor Joseph Locke gave his first professional performance on the stage of the town hall. The town hall in Oma became a very, very popular venue in the 1950s when Paddy Laird and Paddy Bogues worked on the pantomimes and created over many, many years the phenomenally successful pantomimes, which legend has it had buses coming the whole way from Derry, lined up outside the town hall. And the town hall was of its time. The town hall had a lovely gra glass ceiling, but alas, it fell into disrepair. And what, like a phoenix rising from the ashes, the Stool Arts Centre is now the replacement. A centre for the arts, a centre for entertainment and a, a, a centre for musicians and performers. The Star Ballroom, alas, no longer exists. Now there is a plaque to its memory down just outside the South West College. And the Star Ballroom was originally a cinema, which then became a ballroom. Running alongside, um, I mean, the Royal Armistice was a picture house. So it was a star ballroom, really, and St. Island Avenue was the biggest dance hall. But there's a band there called the Melody Aces from uh, Newton Stewart who were contracted to play at the star ballroom every Saturday night. And that contract was pretty long lasting. And uh, it sort of made them and it made the star ballroom. Star ballroom started off as a cinema, which morphed into a dance hall. Uh, and like the Royal Arms started off as a cinema, which morphed into a dance hall. As you can see the changing patterns of entertainment there, you know. My name is Damien Given. Uh, full name is Peter Damien Given, but I'm known as Damien. I spent uh, approximately half my adult life and some of my teenage years, my early teenage years, uh, as a professional musician. First of all, in small groups and then in the show band scene. The Star Ballroom just, uh, that was on the site of where I first began my teaching career. Uh, which was when I finished. So I, I had a recording studio. After the band, I set up a 24-track recording studio, professional recording studio, uh, for had it for about five years. And then in 1987, 
the place was flooded. There was an awesome flood here uh, in Oma, and the place was flooded out, and I lost thousands and thousands of pounds because you couldn't get insurance because I was beside the river. In the Star Ballroom, many, many local bands performed or dances, dinner dances, and it was of its time. It no longer exists, but the memories are there. McSorley's record shop was very, very important in the development of the show bands. It was a record shop that provided music, it provided LPs, EPs, 78s. Initially, it had been a bicycle shop as far as I remember, and it also then was the place where you could get your, the, the old batteries uh, recharged. And Tommy Kernan, who ran or owned McSorley's record shop, uh, w would have provided the most up-to-date songs and tunes for the show bands. Tommy would go up to Belfast on a Monday and bring down the records that he thought would have appealed to the audience of the show bands. Well, if I cast my mind back, say, to the 1970s, uh, to my recollection, you had McSorley's record shop, you also had Black's Furniture Store, which is on the site of uh, Super Value, I think. My memory is right. And they sold records. And also McGrade's in John Street uh, sold records at one point. And they were the, the go-to places for music. And uh, they gradually just dwindled and disintegrated. And that, that, as tastes changed, uh, so the record shops, I think, just in a way faded out. McSorley's would have supplied the latest tunes and songs for the show bands. Tommy Kernan would have gone up to Belfast to buy the latest uh, songs and what he would have thought would be the latest hits that would have appealed to the audiences. And that's how they tapped in. But you have to remember, prior to that, for example, when the, the, the Melody Aces uh, went on the road, they had a wealth of material that had been brought back by Shea Hutchinson from America. So they had access to American country music that other performers would not have had or heard. Well, McSorley's was a business. And like all businesses, you know, you, you have to provide a service for the people. You have to provide goods that people want to buy. And McSorley saw that bicycles uh, were needed, uh, batteries needed recharged. There was a, the rise of the entertainment industry. And obviously records in particular in the 1960s and the early 70s were a big part of that. So McSorley's went, you know, to use the phrase, went with the flow. The Royal Arms was the preeminent venue for the show bands. A great dance hall, a great atmosphere about the place, and most importantly, owners who knew the entertainment scene inside out and knew what the people of Oma wanted and gave it to them. Well, the, the Royal Arms was a venue that served the people of Oma and the Oma district. Now, the, the local show bands would have rehearsed there, and in particular the platter men rehearsed there, and the platter men were very much associated with the Royal Arms, uh, particularly around the Christmas period. But other show bands came and performed, and other singers came and performed. You had uh, say singers like Tom Jones performed there, Dusty Springfield, uh, the American singer Jim Reeves, and uh, I remember going to see Thin Lizzy in the Royal Arms. Royal Arms, there were dances all weekend, but when I was young, um, maybe nine or, I was that young actually, we, myself and my brother Jimmy, we used to be guest artists. The band would play for like two hours, then there'd be a break, then the guest artists would come on and perform for half an hour, and people wouldn't dance, they'd all gather around the stage and we'd do our half an hour, then they'd go back to dancing. And I was so young, when I came home from school, my mother put me to bed. <laughs> I had to get up again at 9 o'clock at night and go and do the Royal Arms. And, uh, and then later on, of course, 
in my teens, along with all the other young men and young ladies, we would have went to the Royal Arms on a Friday or a Saturday night to hear the Plattermen and the Royal Shoe Band, all the big shoe bands would have played there then. It was a great time. Uh, well, the Royal Arms would be one of my standout memories because it was always packed uh, on a Friday or a Saturday. Um, night. Um, they also, Royal Arms started bringing some big names. I mean, I remember Engelbert Humperdinck singing it, playing it, singing at the Royal Arms. Um, and uh, uh, I don't know if Tom Jones ever got there, but some of the big English names that we normally only saw on television would pop up as a guest artist, you know. So, um, uh, yeah, yeah, the Royal Arms particularly. Because we were a pop band, uh, pop bands weren't uh, so common, that there were more country and Irish or country and Western or country and whatever you want to call it. Uh, uh, so we, we would normally be called on to be the support for any of these groups. The Tremolos, uh, we did support for the, them as well. Um, uh, and we would do tours of the country and uh, we would support these groups wherever they would go. Uh, man for Man, Mike Depot, the guy who wrote handbags, glad rags, you know, we, we got to meet all these guys. Roy Wood, was it? Had a, sat, sat on top of an AC30 amp with him smoking a senior, senior service cigarette, chatting about, uh, about, about music at the time. And, uh, we, we were sort of regular, regular uh, band in the Royal Arms Hotel. And we used to draw a, a really, really big crowd. Uh, but um, the, um, we, we, would play, we played, support there to both Engelbert Humperdinck and Tom Jones. Uh, we played uh, support to Tom Jones. When, when that happened, the, 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 the artist would come up. There was a set of um, uh, escape stairs, uh, exit, uh, an emergency exit at the bottom right hand side of the ballroom. And that's where they used to bring the, the main artist in and they would come in through a wee side door and then get up onto the stage and they built a partition to, uh, just for these artists so that they could get on the stage. Uh, uh, Tom Jones arrived with his four-piece backing group called The Squires. Uh, they were just a guitar group and uh, he arrived with his tuxedo. The Squires came on, did a few songs and then Tom jumped up on stage and we were talking to him and and, and, uh, and he was he, he was really really down to earth and just a, a, a cool dude he used to be a very famous clarinet player english guy huge in the charts he had a song called stranger on the shore his name was acker bilk he used to play here he packed the place but he used to stay in the royal arms and one night elaine told me this there was no room in the royal arms but there was a hotel up on high street called the melville hotel up here and she booked him into the Melville. So when he got to town, he goes, Elaine, I'm not staying in the Melville Hotel. I've got to stay in the Royal Arms. She goes, well, the Royal Arms is packed. You've got to stay in the Melville. He goes, Elaine, no stay, no play. And she goes, well, Acker, no play, no pay. <laughs> so then he went and he stayed. Uh, we were then playing support for uh, Engelbert Humperdinck. And Engelbert Humperdinck really, really had some sort of a thing about his head getting through the door. He was he was sort of a prat of the highest order. He didn't want to know us, didn't want to know anything at all. He, he was wearing his tuxedo. He, he took out, in the middle of it all, when things warmed up, he pulled off the coat. And he, he gave the coat to one of the guys in the band. And the guy took the coat and hung it over the back of a chair. The place was stuffed. The place was really stuffed. There were 1,300 people, over 1,300 people in the Royal Arms, which were, had a license to hold 800 people. And uh, the floor started to crack, started to give way. At one stage, people started squealing and screaming, but uh, up at the front, you could hear the, the floor go <coughs> with the weight of all the people up pushing up on the stage to get a glimpse of Engelbert. But um, he took this notion that the people in the back can't see me. Um, got, can somebody get me two, chair, two more chairs? The, got in the two, two chairs, he stood up in the two chairs. He, he started singing. The song, I think, was uh, ten, 10 Guitars, which is a sort of up-tempo thing. And he, uh, he proceeded then to pull off his bow tie. Uh, after the bow tie, he started opening the top buttons of his shirt 
uh, to show a wee bit of hair in his chest. And then he pulled, he opened up the waistcoat, and then, not satisfied with that, he put, whipped the waistcoat off, and he started swinging the waistcoat around the top of his head. But he was cute enough to know that this is an expensive waistcoat. I'm not, I'm not letting this go out into the crowd. So he, he made sure he swung it backwards, and it hit me in the face. I was, I was standing at the back. I was standing at the back of the stage, and it hit me right in the face. Uh, and I remember I caught Claude that they got there and I just rolled it up into the ball and I fired it and had him in the back. <laughs> I was so disgusted with the man. I had never liked him, never liked him, never bull liked him. I said for crying. Isn't it amazing the way that our attitude towards music and entertainment have changed and evolved over the years? T.S. Eliot, the great American writer, in his poem, The Love Song of J. Alfred Prufrock, said, I have measured out my life in coffee spoons. Well, I have measured my life out in LPs and singles and EPs. I can trace growing up through the records that I bought, and when I hear a certain song, it can transport me back. There's a rise now in vinyl, as opposed to CD, as opposed to digital downloads. And... Vinyl records have become collector's items and Boneyard Records in Oma is an emporium that deals specifically and mainly in old vinyl. And it's fascinating to look at the, the differences in the presentation of LP's vinyl. You can see how little money was spent by a lot of the bands and performers and you can see how much money was spent. And I suppose the high point in that was Peter Blake, the great English pop artist, uh, creating the, the, the cover of Sgt Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band by the Beatles in 1967. And that, I think, marked a change. And if you go down to Boneyard Records, you can see different LPs, different LP covers, and also there's a unique collection of posters, advertising dances. These were created in Montgomery's Printing Works, which I think is now in the Folk Museum in Coltra. And in Boneyard Records, you can actually see posters for uh, local performances by Dusty Springfield, by Taste, and Taste, as you know, was the, the band created by Rory Gallagher. And Tom Jones, you can see posters from their time. And the thing that really strikes me is the cost. The entrance cost seven and six to get in to see some of these performers. You know, minimal by our standards, but in the 1960s, a lot. Boneyard Records, well worth a visit. It's a, an emporium of history, and it's a kind of a cultural history. There's an old jukebox there as well, and uh, a very, very knowledgeable owner who could actually go in depth into almost every LP that he has. Well worth a visit. The Labour Hall was a Noma institution, and in the Labour Hall, Many of the local bands rehearsed and practiced. The Labour Hall was a kind of a community venue just off John Street where the Way Inn stands now. Alas, it is no longer. But it was very, very important in the evolution of the show bands, in particular in the early days. Well, the Labour Hall, it didn't perform. That's where you practice. That's where, that's where all the show bands used to practice. That's where St Eugene's Brass Band uh, used to practice every Sunday. That's where that was our headquarters. So you didn't play there. Everyone just practiced there. And that was the bottom. We lived at a row uh, called Fairmount Terrace. And the Labour Hall was at the very bottom of the Gallows Hill, the bottom of Fairmount Terrace. Um, all the show bands, the platter men, the polka dots, uh, everyone practiced in the Labour Hall. In fact, it was a Labour Hall. It was built for unions. Gallows Hill was a place of a lot of working men, carpenters, painters, bricklayers, and each union had a, would have a meeting there, like one night a month or whatever. That's why, that's why it was called the Labour Hall. And then it was used for the show bands to practice uh, during the day. 
The Labour Hall was called the Labour Hall because it was uh, owned by the local trade union congress. So all the trade unions for all the different, for plasters, for plumbers, for, for all the different trades that were very, very strong back in those days. They used to have meetings and, and, and all their meetings would take place on different evenings in, in the Labour the labor Hall, hence the name, as I say, Labour Hall. It was for people, uh, labourers, not labourers, but people who were labour involved. The late Brian Call would talk fondly uh, of his memories of actually flicking pebbles onto the wall or the the roof of the labour hall to disrupt the musicians and uh, this lovely image of, of the great Brian Call uh, just rather cheekily creating mayhem just for the sheer fun of it. The Irish National Foresters, uh, known as the INF, was a very important venue for the performer in the 1950s and 60s. St Eugene's band were closely associated with the INF and the, the, the Foresters were a kind of a community venue uh, that provided uh, entertainment for the people of Oma. Well, the INF was the, the, the venue for many, many dances and many performers would have honed their skills on the stage of the INF. You know, it was a, a venue where people were out for a night out and uh, it was very much a social event and as I said many dances uh, would have taken place over the years in the INF. Well the INF was by its constitution very much a, an Irish institution. You know you had the INF which would have had its, its, kind of, its catchment area. Uh, equally you had the Orange Hall would have had its catchment area and in these venues you know, people would have got together and sometimes they would have catered perhaps for one audience rather than another. But you can't say that it was specifically one side or the other. Uh, again, with the rise of the Troubles, entertainment in a way became segregated as well because people were loath to go out, people were afraid to go out at times. And of course the, the, uh, the Miami uh, killings really marked a point when entertainment in this part of the world changed forever. Well I think people who were members of the, the Irish National Foresters, uh, their friends and their families, uh, it would have been a form of a social club I, I, I suppose you could, you could describe it as. And it was also uh, the ethos of the, the INF and the Foresters was that it was there to help people to, to run events to help you know, to raise funds to help others you know so there is a kind of a social aspect and a very much a community aspect I don't know if you could actually say that it catered to one say sector or part of the town but uh, as with all venues and particular with the the rise of the troubles you know people felt safer going to a place that was easily accessed and was safe Oh, the no jiving signs. Well, why were the no jiving signs there? Well, jiving perhaps was per looked upon as maybe a step too far. A step too far. This kind of, you know, not, it wasn't very sedate. It wasn't a kind of dancing that was elegant. And these were not Fred Astaire's and Ginger Rogers dancing around the ballroom. You know, jiving was energetic. It was obviously a lot of fun and to perhaps some of the older generation this was looked upon as something that was um, not quite right you know if you take it back a few generations you know you listen to a singer like Bing Crosby and he, Bing Crosby is very much an old crooner and is very gentle but in his early days in the 1920s he was actually looked upon as a threat because with his singing it was almost whispered because he was using a microphone. Singers before that would have had no microphone and they would have bellowed the song out but suddenly you have Bing Crosby coming along and it's very kind of very uh, intimate and perhaps the same kind of thought occurred 
to the older generation who viewed Javan as just a step too far that could perhaps lead to something else that we don't even want to think about. Links between the, the assorted uh, entertainment areas, I don't know if there were any kind of links in terms of uh, sharing of resources, sharing of personnel. And uh, you know, you have to remember that in the 1950s and 60s and 70s, venues were few and far between. And it's only perhaps with the rise of the Royal Arms in the early 1960s that OMA you know, really can cater for big bands, for big sounds, and most importantly, for a big crowd. The Knocknavo Castle, owned by the Campbell family, was turned into an entertainment venue by a man called Michael Ward. And I remember going to concerts and dances in the Knocknavo. And the Knocknavo had its time, like all entertainment venues. Very, very successful at weekends. Uh, performers like uh, Don McLean, who wrote American Pie, performed in the Knocknavo. And uh, reputedly, to go back into its history, uh, it was the base for American officers during the war, during the Second World War. Uh, again, it had a different atmosphere from the Royal Arms, and I think, in a way, a different crowd. You know, like the public public houses in the town. You know, these things are cyclical. People will go to one particular place for a while, and then perhaps change to somewhere else. So uh, dance halls you know, were the same, ballrooms were the same, and I suppose music tastes changed, and they do change and they evolve over the years. So the, the bands that come change, you know, the show bands, when they faded out, they were replaced by pop bands. You know. So everything has its time. And the, the, the Knock Namo certainly was a very, very important, popular venue. Knock Namo was, um, was, was a, a became, became uh, from a, a sport, sort of fairly, uh, fairly middle of the road venue to being a really, really big venue, which was stuffed every, every weekend. Uh, it was Mickey, he owned a, 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 painting, a painting, painting contracting business. But uh, he 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 owned he bought the hotel, took it over. Uh, they they put it, installed new lighting, this really fancy lighting in the, in the scene. Uh, I remember playing there with a few. Uh, I played there with Herman's Hermits. An entertainment venue must have an atmosphere. The Knock Namo, though it was outside. The, well, it wasn't outside the limits of the town, but it was kind of. It was a, if you were walking to it, you'd, you know, if you lived, we'll say, on the far side of the town, you know, you had a right bit to dander, as they would say, in this neck of the woods. Um, it just had an atmosphere about it. You know, it, it was a, a different atmosphere from the Royal Arms. It was, of course, a different venue. It, it was sprawling, whereas the Arms was much more compact. And, and again, ultimately, you know, you go to a dance. You're going to see the band, you're going to meet up with your friends, you know, so you, know, you, you, you find a place that suits your particular interests, your particular uh, type of music that you want uh, to listen to, to dance to, you know, so it had its own catchment area and of course these things change over time. The late George Harrison from the Beatles uh, said in, in one of his... Uh, Albums, a triple album, he says, all things must pass. All things certainly do pass. The dance halls, the ballrooms had their day. The Knock the Moe itself uh, succumbed to a fire in the 1990s. The Knock the Moe was no longer there. It remains in name only, and of course, the, the plaque put up by the council to mark where it stood. It's now a host of private houses. And it's hard to believe that that, where all those private houses stand, that that was once a thriving venue of entertainment, where people would go to be entertained by musicians, by performers, and to dance the night away. But all things 
have their day. Well, thank you very much for listening to my, my heritage rambles. I've taken you through my history of the show bands in Oma and the places of interest in Oma. But remember, the definitive history has not been written. There are many publications out there that uh, reference the show bands, talk about the show bands, and there are very, very few critical histories of the show bands, but it's, it's a, it is a history to be told. Now, what I would suggest is that you come to the Struhl Art Centre, you take a look at the exhibition, you follow the path around the town. Some of the places are still extant, they still exist. Others are mere memories. But follow that trail and talk to people of the town. Talk to them about their memories. And most importantly, listen to the music of the show bands. And that will bring you back into that wonderful era that had a lifespan of what, 15 years but that is still so important to so many people. And perhaps, like the phoenix from the ashes, the show bands will rise again. Way up in the northern Oak Tyrone, there's a girl I long to call my own. The sweetest road that Ireland's ever grown. And true with the moon and stars above, I'm falling head over heels in love with a pretty little girl from Oma in the county of Tyrone. There's cute little girls in Ostraban, oh, they're just as pretty in Monaghan, for this to every rover and I is known. And true with the moon and stars above, I'm falling head over heels in love with a pretty little girl from Oma in the county of Tyrone.